Yeah, happy Friday. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Likewise, thank you. But we're going to talk about America's National Park Season 2 that premiered Monday. Yep. I got a chance to check it out, and my cat enjoyed it too, along with me. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear. I'm glad that we're making good shows for wildlife to watch too. Yes, I shared with Robert a video of my cat enjoying and being all tense on the in front of the screen. <laughs> what, what, which episode were they getting tense at? Uh, he was watching the fox, uh, trying to oh, yeah. you know hunt, and then you know how she's like trying to dive into the hole, and he, she was just like enjoying that episode along with the rest. That was just the beginning of it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, let's talk about this uh, new season. Everything we'll be watching um, gives a little brief. Well, I mean, America's National Park season two, you know, Wild Star Films, we're very lucky to be given 10 episodes to make by National Geographic. This is our second run of five. And I think that our aim for this run really was to shine a light on the lesser known national parks. Um, maybe the places that a lot of people don't know exist, but still have incredible stories, not just wildlife, but history, culture, you know, anthropology, all sorts of stories that we wanted to bring them alive. So in this run, we do have one very famous park, Grand Tetons, but I'd say the other four are probably ones that people might not be familiar with. So it's Lake Clark National Park, Voyagers, Channel Islands, Biscayne. And what we wanted to do was bring our A-list filmmaking to these places that people might not know are that special and just try and show how special they really are. I never really put it, put two and two together that when it comes to national parks, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be like tall trees or above ground, but also underground and not realizing there's one like in the backyard of Miami. That's impressive. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we chose um, a lot of these national parks because they are in places that you might not expect, like Biscayne um, or Channel Islands off the coast of California. Um, and I think they, they're they important to, to focus on as well because, uh, well, Biscayne is an example, you know, I think that's an example of a national park that lives amongst us, lives very close to human activity. And um, it's important, it's an important story for the America's National Park System, but also for the world, because as, as our world shrinks and we get closer to, to these parks or closer to wild places, uh, it's important for us to learn how to keep them protected whilst also we have our cities nearby. And in, this, in these stories, uh, you also have the personalities uh, that compose these natural parks, these beautiful creatures. Can you talk about those stories and maybe one favorite of yours? Yeah, I mean, I think America's National Parks gives us a great opportunity uh, as storytellers to actually give each park its own identity. And when we set out, we wanted these to be love letters to the park, but also we wanted to make sure each park um, their character shone through so we always looked at the place as a as a character as well um, as well as the animal characters that we meet and I think um, when we went into the animal stories we were also really keen to get to know their struggles and how their lives are impacted by the places that they live so thinking of Channel Islands and the Channel Island Fox we worked with local scientists and, and the rangers there to really be able to tell the story of a young male Channel Island fox as he leaves the nest for the first time and has to go and forge his way um, uh, on, on, on that island for the first time. And I think, you know, what's special about the series is that we can tell those individual stories that really connect you to that animal, but they also connect you to the place because when he does that you know uh he doesn't have a roadmap for where to go so we follow this channel island fox as he has to search and find a territory and find food and find a place that could be his home um and to do that we use these uh latest technology drones quiet drones which meant that we could actually follow at a safe distance behind follow this fox in this huge landscape 
as he was searching for, for his new home. For this series, you're executive producer, but I know that you've also been like pretty like hands on when it comes to the, the drones, the cameras for other projects. So did you take a little bit of part of that or what exactly did you do for this series? Wild Star Films has a, um, a technical department. So we actually have a group of experts who we can go to with filming challenges and say, you know, we really want to film this thing underwater and we really want to do it at night and we really want to do this and how would you do it? So we have lots of expertise and we work with, you know, the best cinematographers in the world. So often the, the, the question with the tech is not can you do it, but should you do it? And I think what we do, and we, I'm one of the executive producers on America's National Parks, along with some of our partners at National Geographic, um, what we try and do is focus on what's important for the story, because you could use all amazing technology at every single story with every single animal, but it might not be relevant. And so um, we want to make sure that we're actually telling the best story and then using the best technology to, to tell that story. Um, there was uh, the beaver scene. You guys got a camera in a pretty tight space. Uh, that was that's yeah. quite incredible. Yeah, and you know, filming wildlife is always about the welfare of the animals comes first. Wild Star Films, like all wildlife production companies, has a code of ethics, and we always want natural behaviour from animals. So. Um, we really don't want to disturb them because that footage would be no good. We want to see them in their happy, normal state. And I think what's interesting about putting cameras into beaver lodges or putting cameras around wolf dens to film pups is that these things are only possible thanks to the local biologists, the scientists and the rangers who know these animals so well they know the habitat so well that they can help us get cameras into places that make you think well how did they do that it's it's that marriage between um you know our skill in terms of technology but with that field knowledge that we're so reliant on you know without all those local local without all that local intel we wouldn't be able to get those shots and we wouldn't be able to tell, crucially, we wouldn't be able to tell those important stories of what happens in a beaver lodge when uh, all the family are there and it's tight for space because, you know, it is the size it is or what happens when the, the siblings squabble. And it's those bits that I think really make uh, an animal character come alive. Yeah, that was brilliant. That, that, I, I really enjoyed that, that episode, which is towards the end. Um, another one was uh, the, what, Bear 399, uh, the, the grandma. Oh, yeah. How do you yeah. know 399? I'm so curious. Again, you know, that was in Grand Tetons National Park. I, again, we, we're so lucky to be able to work with um, local biologists and rangers who you know, these are the heroes of, of all national park systems because they are the ones that are helping to protect them, but also keeping an eye, crucially, cre keeping an eye on every single animal um, that they can. And Bear 399, uh, you know, one of the, if not the famous bear, most famous bears in the world, you know, is often spotted, um, is recognisable, and there's which is perfect for us as filmmakers, there's just lots of knowledge there about um, their specific movements, their range, you know, their territory, where they would go. And so that really helped our filming. That is part of a National Geographic's magic. Everyone that's behind behind the camera to give us that, that magic and that joy to watch all these t television series. Say so thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I I enjoyed the series just as much as the sec the first season. I I love Nat Geo. Robert is my witness. He knows like I just I just love watching nature because it just it's escapism to reality, and um, yeah, gives us a smile. Well, even thank you. I will pass that on to the team because they'll love to hear that. And um, it's always great working with National Geographic because they let it, they they give us 
the tools and the opportunity to tell the best stories in the natural world. It's a dream job. It is. I'm very lucky to do it. You are. Thank you so much again and congratulations. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Nancy. Likewise.